Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. This is our extra snuggly episode. Oh my god, it's so cold. It is very cold outside right now. Um, I don't know what happened. We'd had like some nice days, like 60, 70. Yeah. And then now it's bitter cold. Yeah, I think this is what winter's supposed to be. What? <laughs> and we got kind of uh, spoiled there around Christmas. Yeah, I guess so. But it's very cold. We've had a little bit of snow flurrying today. Yeah, it's just so cold. It's wicking all the moisture out of the air. They've also called in like a two-hour delay for tomorrow. Mm, that's good. So we've got Dancing a great school kids. Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday show we can't wait to talk about. Yeah. But we should mention our live show. We had our very first Mountain Murders live show this weekend at Fleetwood in Asheville, North Carolina. Sold out show. Oh my God, it was so awesome meeting some of the Mountain Murders fans. You know what I thought was interesting, Dylan? When we began the show, I told the audience who listens to Mountain Murders regularly. Yeah. And only about a fifth of the crowd raised hands. I know. So we have a lot of new people who are not familiar with our podcast show up, buy tickets. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure, um, which that's great. I'm glad they came, of course. But I'm still trying to figure out if uh, people just saw the event and thought it would be something cool to do. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe we could have some new listeners from that. Either way, I hope so. But we did see some uh, real fans. That was great. That was great. We got to meet Brittany. We had Marsha, Tessa show up. They are definitely some big fans of Mountain Murder. Yeah, and Sunday? Sunday, man, she gifted us with the coolest framed art piece. It's our logo. Yeah. We put it in the living room. It was our first Mount Murder art from a fan. It was really cool. It was incredible. We love it. All right. So, so where do we go from here? Well, Dylan, I have a great case for us today. It's going to take place here, deep in the woods of Western North Carolina, not far from where we call home. We got some deep woods around here, girl. A young woman goes missing. Her family is desperate for answers, especially given the fact that only a few months earlier, her nephew had also vanished. God, family's going through a lot. Marion is a small community at the base of the Appalachian Mountains, about an hour east of Asheville, halfway between Asheville and the Hickory-Lenore area. So it's kind of like right in the middle. Right. The population is roughly maybe 10,000. Now, the town itself, here's a little history about it. It's only about five and a half square miles, but McDowell County is a lot larger. During the Carolina Gold Rush period in the early 19th century, the southern part of the county was known for gold production. Oh. They actually still host a gold festival today where you can go, it's like in the summertime, a couple of uh, days, I think maybe a weekend. You can go with the family and learn all about the gold mines. They have some of the old mines open. Well, I want to go. It sounds like fun, right? Yeah. The film The Last of the Mohicans was also, um, par- you know, partially filmed around the shores of Lake James. And if you remember our drunk Thanksgiving episode, which you probably don't remember. <laughs> I don't we remember were, we it. We pretty slurred. <laughs> um, we had a case that was centered around that Lake James area. Mm. Yeah, I'm just kidding. That was a disturbing case as well. Yes, definitely. Zofia Lowry was a pretty blonde, 25-year-old truck stop waitress living in Marion. Zofia's nickname was Zipper. That's a cool name, Zofia. It is. Um, Zofia was the youngest of four children. She had dropped out of high school at age 16. Friends and family describe her as a very sweet person, fun to be around, always smiling. She collected unicorns, loved writing poetry, always playful, and kids loved her. Well, she sounds like a lot of fun. She's a really happy young woman. She had a very close relationship with her family, including her older sister. She was much younger than the rest of her siblings. So much younger, in fact, that some of her nieces and nephews were fairly close in age with Zofia. In the truck stop where she worked, it was not very far from the resident, so she would often walk back and forth to work unless someone gave her a ride. 
Oh, so she was like the cool fun aunt who's cool to hang out with, right? Yeah. She especially had a close relationship with her nephew. His name was Jeremiah Pittman. Jeremiah's father, Eddie, was a fairly neglectful man, providing Jeremiah with an unstable home life. People describe Jeremiah as just very, very quiet, shy, introvert, but he found a kindred spirit in his aunt. Now, he confided in Zelfia. They were more like brother and sister than they were aunt and nephew. They were very close. Like, people would say they were best friends. Oh, so you always saw them together. You see one, you see the other kind of thing like that. You're always hanging out, okay. having a good time together. And, you know, that was the one person in his family he felt like he could really turn to, to, you know, confide in if he was having a bad day. He can count on her. Always. Because he can't count on his daddy, it don't sound like. In September of 1992, Jeremiah's mother reported him missing. The young man vanished without a trace, leaving only his pickup truck on the side of the highway. His roommate told authorities he'd gone to his daddy's house. Jeremiah was also a high school dropout, and he didn't have a job at the time. There was not a lot of concern. Rumors circulated that the young man had hopped into a trucker's cab, making his way to Texas. Even his father told authorities he thought his son had left town. Family had hoped he was somewhere, maybe, you know, making a new life for himself. But they also thought it was a bit odd that he would just leave everything behind. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't take their damn car with them if they're taking off? I mean, you need the car when you get somewhere else. Well, Zelfia knew that Jeremiah would not leave without telling her his whereabouts, his plans, where he was going. Again, they're like best friends. This pair is very close. Zelfia expressed worries to relatives about Jeremiah. She explained that she was going to go confront Eddie Pittman about Jeremiah's disappearance. She had this really strong feeling that he may know more about his son and what was going on with Jeremiah. Yeah, because I'm sure she's heard all the stories from Jeremiah about his dad being an asshole to him. Well, she just didn't trust Eddie Pittman and knew that he was not a good guy. Jeremiah's disappearance was baffling to investigators. I mean, detectives chased leads from Florida to Texas, but as the years passed, questions remain. If the young man had in fact left for a better life elsewhere, why would he never call home? He never asked for money. If he tried applying for a job, his social security number would be found through the National Crime Information Center Network. I mean, unless this is a guy who's going to go as far as changing his social security number right. and assume a new identity. A new identity. But then that leads to more questions of, like, why? Why would he do that? Yeah. So you, it just didn't make any sense to investigators. Yeah, I hate to say it. It sounds like someone who's no longer living. June 27, 1993. Zofia had not returned from work. Her family finds it a bit odd, but they try to file a missing persons report. Authorities basically don't have any interest oh, in taking their report. All the time. Now, Zofia would sometimes spend a few days at a time away from home. They thought maybe she wasn't missing. She was a free spirit. She liked to party. She liked to have a good time. She'll turn up in a few days. This is basically what the police told her family. Jeremiah and Zofia were both missing, so here you've got two relatives in the same family. Clearly, this family is devastated. I mean, how much tragedy could a family endure? Yeah, so they've wondered all that time what happened to Jeremiah, and now she's gone. I mean, that's crazy. The family begins asking questions. They start taking the investigation on themselves. They comb the truck stop where Zofia worked. They have her picture. They're asking folks. You know, have you seen her? Do you know where she is? Any information? But people are kind of reluctant to talk. And it seems that no one has answers as to, you know, where Zofia might be. Jeremiah is still missing as well. So this family is just trying everything they can to get some answers. Well, I mean, they had to do it themselves. It doesn't sound like they're getting a lot of support from authorities. Well, they're not. And I think that, you know, this happens... In small towns, you know, the last case we discussed was the Nancy Morgan case. And that definitely seemed like a botched investigation of 
just law enforcement who didn't really have any interest at all in doing police work or bothering people or bringing in this good old boys network. Oh, my God. And it just seems like this is another one of those cases where they don't want to take the missing persons report seriously. They maybe look down on this family a little bit like, oh, well, you're not important in this community. Yeah, I mean, Zilfia is just this truck stop waitress. Right. She's not a doctor's daughter. Oh, well, she's probably a lot lizard. Ooh. I mean, you know, they just don't seem to really want to help. And I saw some interviews with her sister, and her sister said she felt like they were treated as second-class citizens, like the law enforcement officers did, like look down on their family. Well, that's what it sounds like. And, I, and I'm sure there's a reason that this happens a lot with cops all over, you know, not just small towns, but all over the country is they must get a shitload of, you know, false alarms, if you will, on missing people. They must. They have this general idea that, oh, they must be a runaway, blah, blah, blah. They left on their own accord, all that. But it just takes that one cop with a good instinct sometimes to say, hey, you know, catch that one detail that this is weird. Or if you have a whole family down there saying, this is not like them. They're responsible. You know, they always do this, be it church, work, school. Maybe somebody should drive out and take a look around and ask a few questions. I mean, is it that hard? I feel like maybe today things might be a little different with social media. Yes. People can create their own buzz. You can. You know, if they have a missing child, they can take to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and everyone sharing photos and trying to help. And I right. think that a lot of times catches the attention of law enforcement because people are calling them out. Like, why are you not helping us find this missing kid? Right. We've seen that in our own town with a friend's daughter that went missing. Sure did. So I think that maybe today there's a little more interest in helping these situations. I think some agencies have kind of learned from their mistakes in the past. And if a family is coming to you and saying, this is completely out of character for this person. Right. And with everything we know now about true crime and serial killers, and there's just so much more information available, right. I feel like they might take it a bit more seriously and, than, uh, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's a good point you made about the social media. Us regular folk, no matter where we live or how we came up, do have the power to put pressure back on the authorities or our local government. We do. February 5th, 1994, hunters are out on a dirt road near Lake James where they happen to find human skeletal remains, including bones with tissue and clumps of hair. A sheet towel and some clothing items, like a pants, a pair of pants, a bra, a shirt, are also discovered near the body. The remains were not concealed in any way. There was no grave or anything. It wasn't like anyone had taken time to try to bury this body. It basically had just been left out in the open. That's crazy. However, it had been left out in the open, you know, with the elements, the animals. So, you know, it was pretty seriously decomposed at that point. Like I mentioned, they found bones, did have some tissue left, but, you know, it was fairly progressed in decomposition. Investigators conclude it is the body of Zulfia Lowry. Her skull was almost crushed completely and the body dumped in the woods. Her cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. The medical examiner believes she'd likely been hit with a heavy object in the back of the head. They don't believe that she was murdered there. They believe she was murdered elsewhere and brought to this place to be, you know, disposed of. Right. Once Zulfia's body is discovered, authorities have a murder on their hands. There were no real leads in the case, so it goes cold. Yeah, because they ain't been working a damn case from the moment it started when she went missing. Precisely. Oh, that's, God. Yeah, you're that just pisses me right. off. One witness claimed to have seen Zelfia get into a vehicle with a man, but could not offer up any kind of good description. I mean, as time had passed, it had been a while, and, you know, you don't always pay attention to those details. No, you definitely don't. Not in your daily life. Rumors, again, were swirling around the small town. People speculated Zelfia's murder was drug-related. She had been killed by a group of men and disposed of in the woods. was like another story that went around town. But nothing 
you know, came to fruition from these stories. They were all just rumors, gossip. Thinkers also pointed 